I'm gonna start by saying I got asked to to do solutions for stuff. So I started doing that. Uh, you have the homework solutions here. Um, I haven't done the exam yet. You have the honors problems, um, two of them. I have to finish the last one and the exam. So um, you can look at those. Uh, hopefully, I hope they're help helpful. Um, and if you know if you see something there that you don't understand, it's probably a mistake. Uh, you should let me know. Um, okay, so we we're halfway through. We're almost done, but I'm gonna start over. We were gonna show that the Gaussian integers form an integral uh, Euclidean domain. So let me first of all remind you what that meant. Um, good morning. Well, is that seven people? Holy crap. Um, hello. Hello. I just wanted to test that. All right. But then we're not in the same problem as last time. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm having a problem, I think. Okay. Uh, the, the app is not updating. Anyway, we. A Euclidean domain was a domain where you you have some sort of well you have a function to the natural number some some sort of size for example here we take the the complex absolute value squared just so we get a whole number and we got to show that every time we have two uh, two Gaussian integers Gaussian integers are these numbers a plus b i we we can do division with remainder. And there's a remainder that is smaller than the denominator. And right now we're just, this is where we are. Um, maybe, maybe I can go like this. Oh, oh, it's back. No, no, no. Yeah. Is it back? Okay, I think it's back. Right. Um, so this means we need to prove that for all pairs of numbers um, in here, I guess. You can see y by zero. Uh, that's not going to work. Um, we we can write alpha equals q beta plus remainder, and the valuation of the remainder is smaller than the valuation of the denominator. So this is what we need to show. The trick was do the division um, over the rational numbers and and take the, the closest integers. So let's do it. So um, you can you can actually divide you can divide um, you can divide complex numbers. So let's say um, you do this by writing the fraction
and uh, multiply and divide by the conjugate of So you basically you write a fraction with complex numbers. The way you you do that computation is is by rationalizing the denominator, which is I think something you learned a long time ago. Um, replace i by negative i and multiply and divide by uh, by that. So the denominator will become a real number. In this case, a natural number. So so these two uh, these two are rational numbers in general. I mean, of course, if they're integers, we're done. The remainder is zero. So what we do next is um, split C1 and C2 into an integer and a rational number. which is smaller than one half. Uh, so we can always do this, right? Uh, you take, you have any fraction, you can split it into, into a whole number and then a rational number that is the most one half in absolute value. Oh, stop thinking again. What? Ugh. What is it? Like this? Does anything happen? Let me start thinking. Uh. Is Google trying to tell me something? Hey, Roy. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to give it a shot again. Next time, I'm just going to, I'm just going to restart the tablet and see what happens. So um, anyway, what I was saying is, you take you take any fraction, you can you can find the the nearest number, the nearest whole number, and what's the distance to that nearest whole number? Well, it's the most. It's either plus one half, negative one half, something in between, but it can be larger. I mean, I'm no computer scientist, but I feel like every software update just makes things worse for everything. Uh, okay. And it's a whole number. Oh, now it's back. Every time I start writing. Okay, so you take both of these of these whole numbers and you split them into their closest integer and a fraction. The fraction is going to be smaller than one half. Uh, because that's the furthest that a real number can be from a whole number. So this way we can write this as a Gaussian integer and these numbers don't have names, but um, something in Q at join I. So um, <clears throat> this looks uh, looks promising. Um, so we're trying. So this is what we're trying to get. So what should I do to get this, uh, this red equation? Mm. 
multiply by beta on both sides. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Mason gets the point. Um, yeah, multiply by beta. So alpha is is going to be uh, well. That's what that's what alpha is. Um, so let me just write the same copy this equation in the next page is going to be beta times some Gaussian integer which is great and then something that looks like well the remainder uh, and our hope is that it's uh, small enough and that it's an integer so this is where we are. And we know that n1 and n2 are integers. f1 and f2 are rationals. They are most one half. And we want, um, we want to show that this number, let's call it, let's call it r, r, We need two things. We need the. Oh, it's not updating again. Ah, thank you. Right. Um, I'm just gonna restart the tablet. Hopefully, that will make it less angry. Ah. Okay. Um. So. We know and one and two are integers. Um, if one and two are rationals, at most one half, and we want uh, to say that the remainder just go R uh, beta. I don't have a beta. So I need two things of the remainder. I want its valuation to be smaller than the valuation of beta, which looks very promising. The other thing I want is that it's actually a whole number. Could you go back one slide just for like 10 seconds? Sure, I can. Uh... <laughs> All right, thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, okay, so that's really, so these two things are all I need to prove. Um, so, well, R, if I look at the valuation um, at the absolute value, R is the product of beta and, and this number. And well, what can I do here? That, I mean, one thing I can always do is expand, write things out. Uh, what if I don't want to do that? You can do the valuation of B times the valuation of F1 plus F2. Right, exactly. That's uh, definitely, the the lazy way to go and lazy is the correct way to go in math you always do the smallest amount of work you can do so so here's well the thing i'm supposed to compare with and is this number that i'm multiplying smaller than one that's really the only question um and well it is because these are both smaller than one half. And the square of one half 
plus the square of one half is one half, which is smaller than one. So you take a number, you multiply it by something smaller than one, the number decreases. All right. Any questions? So I want to show that R actually is made of integers. And I want to use this equation. And remember that this term at the end is called is what I'm calling R. So how can I show that? Since actually, never mind. Since alpha is in ZI, then that means R is in ZI? Alpha is in ZI. Um, yeah, I'm a bit confused as to how we know or want to show that um, R is in ZI. Well, I mean, that's what I'm trying to show. Um, that's what we're, we're trying to get. Um, so, okay, so Sensor made a good point that this we know is a is an integer. Uh, this we don't know. Which I think puts us halfway there. The the beta term is also an integer. The beta term is also an integer. Uh, this is an integer. This is an integer. So if we solve for R here. It's the, the difference of two integers, and that makes it an integer. So just from, from the fact that it fits into this equation, that's it, that's all we need, it's, it's, which is actually fantastic because, um, because it saves us like the work of expanding, trying to check that the denominator is not actually there. Um, so, so that's it. Uh, sensor gets a bonus point. Um, and now I found an equation for the division. I found the quotient. I found the remainder. It's an it's an integer, and it's smaller than the denominator. That's it. That makes the Gaussian integers and that makes them a Euclidean domain, that makes it them a PAD, makes them a U of D. And now you know, like, so, so that's it. Um, is a Euclidean domain. Uh, which makes it a PAD, which makes it a U of D. So now you know that every number factors uniquely into, into, into primes, which means, uh, let's see if they reduce the No, it didn't. Oh, no. No, I just forgot to do switch slides. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I wasn't, I was going to leave this for, for another day, but, um, 
I mean, so, uh, okay. So, I should say, this was an example. Um, and I should say, sometimes this works, sometimes it, it doesn't, you know. Um, so, for example, I don't know. If you try to do it for this one, this is a Euclidean domain as well. If you try to do it for the one the one I gave you in in last week's homework, it's also a Euclidean domain. Um, but if you try, I think this one, this one, this is like pretty hard to show. Um, this is a PID, but it's not a Euclidean domain. <clears throat> so this is a very convenient way to show that these this rings having to do with whole numbers are uh, PIDs, but it doesn't it's not guaranteed to work. But also, uh, let me tell you some stuff. So I feel like when you're learning math, when you start learning math, you, you have this feeling, at least I had this feeling that all math was known uh it, it really feels like there's there's just like very very few gaps um i don't know I, I wonder how many open problems you can name but you at this stage you start seeing just more and more open problems and all of a sudden you realize you, we don't we don't know anything um so if you look for example at this wikipedia page um so this is talking about well He's talking, I mean, Wikipedia has a problem that it's always very sophisticated, but uh, class number one means um, we're talking about a UFT. So this is saying, so if you look at this silly looking list, this is telling us that um, this is telling us when Z when this stuff is a U of D, more or less, or maybe, yeah, well, I'm slightly lying here, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, so when when D, well, I guess it says negative one. So, well, what do I? So when when you take square root of negative one, we just saw that this is a U of G so, and a PID. Uh, and for these numbers and only these negative numbers, you get a U of G, which is, I don't know, it's pretty silly. Like why, I, I have no idea what's special in negative 163. I mean, I'm, I'm not expressing this, but it seems like- That is pretty crazy. It, it is pretty crazy, but this is not the, the crazy part. The crazy part comes with, um, well, the crazy part is when Zoom freezes on you. Um, you I mean, you can still see that. So the 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 parts just above talks about the the ones that are real. So the roots of positive numbers. And you ask for which ones are U of Ds, and there's there's a list, and it says it's complete until D equals one hundred. And then what do we know? Uh, I mean. Again, I'm no expert. I don't know exactly what we know, but um, what do we know? It says we know that not all prime numbers come into one mo modulo four of here. <laughs> For example, two hundred and twenty-nine, and we don't even know if this list is infinite. I think we think it is. Oh, my phone just died. We think the list goes on forever, and. Nobody has a clue. I, I mean, if you solve this, I think you would become really famous. Um, they think it's 76%, so we don't even know if it's infinite, infinitely many. So class number one means it's a UFD. What about numbers greater than one? Because I see, you know, talks about class. Right, so infinite. I'm not gonna get into it in this class, but honestly, you know, I could tell you what the class number is. Um, with what you know, it's just something about ideals. But to every to all of these rings, you can you can 
And all these rings have a group associated to them. And, and it's a finite group and it's called the class group. And it has something to do with the ideals. And basically that group is trivial the and the class number is the size of the group. And the group is trivial whenever uh, whenever you have a PID and it's and it's bigger, the bigger it is, sort of the less, the fewer principal ideals you have, essentially. Um, so then you get into the question, once you discover the class group, you get into the question of what are, you know, can I compute all the class groups? And it's just like an insane question. Uh, I know that it's just, I know a lot of, I know a lot of people who just, that's what they do, trying to understand class groups, trying to, since you realize that computing individual ones, like, you know, a theorem that says, if you give me a D, for example, I give you the class number is basically hopeless. Or, you know, today, I think it's impossible to start seeing, saying things like, can I like asymptotically see what it happens and try to, you know, turn this into a probability question. I don't know people, I mean, people do really crazy stuff. Um, uh, fortunately, I'm not, I'm not very qualified to say much more about this. I just know, I just know you start getting into these questions. You start like, you walk into the unknown really, really fast and you get really, really deep into the unknown because, you know, now I'm just talking about square roots, but what if you start talking about cubic roots? Then, well, I mean, it's in this article, but... <laughs> I'm sure like we know very, very little. Okay, so Zoom is frozen. I gotta probably control all the leads, see what happens. Oh, it's not frozen on our end. Yeah, but I can't do anything. <laughs> uh, now test manager is frozen. I can see, like I can see myself moving, but the for some reason, the, the sharing of the screen is just gone. Oh, and now Task Manager is frozen. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, can I, can I kill? Oh, there you go. All right. Okay. Um, All right, since we're here, um, so this is a problem. Maybe I'll talk about this. Um, so my plan, so we have a bunch of makeup days, um, but I don't want to, I don't want to make you come live on those days. So I think I'm just gonna record the class for those days and try to make it something that's not very essential. Um, Maybe so, you could throw in like little prompt questions into those recorded lectures. Sure, we could do that. Um, and then, you know, so it can at least be a tiny bit interactive if you do go that route. Yeah, I mean, honestly, anytime you can just ask me questions and I'll answer them, you know, if I True, don't. But I mean, for the for the makeup, yeah. date, you do just recorded a recorded lecture. So this is a, I don't know. I mean, so um, since forever, people have asked questions about equations with whole numbers. And when, which numbers you can write as a sum of two squares is like a very natural question. And I think Gauss solved this. He's probably doing what we're doing, sort of doing what we're doing now, which is interesting because before Gauss, people didn't really use complex numbers. They, eh, they, they did a little bit, it was iffy. Um, they definitely didn't write them on a, as a plane like we do nowadays. And I think Gauss solved this using um, using complex numbers. So, I don't know, I think I'll, I'll talk about this in the future because it's a really interesting question. For example, every prime that is one mod four can, is the sum of two squares. Um, so what primes are one mod four? 13. These are called 
I think Diophantine equations, right? Right, Diophantine equations are equations where you, this, you ask the solutions to be integers. Um, what's one mod for? It's only nine. So why would this work? You know, and, and the answer, the, the easiest answer I know just uses that this ring is a U of D, what we just showed. Anyway, I'll get back to that at some point. Um, so we're almost done with the chapter. Uh, now we're going to talk about um, factorization in polynomial rings. Um, <clears throat> And this section uh, is basically Gauss's lemma. So we've already seen the relation uh, between factoring over the integers and over the rationals, polynomials over the integers and the rationals. Um, and we can follow the same proof. Um, uh, to show that if um, R is a U of D, factoring over, over R, polynomials over R, is essentially the same as um, factoring over the field of fractions. Like isomorphic to it? No, I don't, I mean, the precise way is what we're about to say. Basically, remember what we said for the rationals is if you're irreducible over the integers, you're irreducible over the rationals. Basically, that's that's the important stuff. You have a polynomial over the over the integers, over the, and you factor it over the rationals, and that factorization works over the integers. So they're the same problem, you know. Um, of course, over the rationals, there's more polynomials because there's like one halves and stuff, but um, so what I'm saying is you could factor over the rationals by doing some silly things like this, but you said this factorization, which obviously doesn't work over the integers, um, but it doesn't work because, I mean, it's very easy to make it work. Just, uh, pull out the denominator. And you're going to find somewhere to cancel it. So, any factorization over the rationals somehow, after shuffling constants around, works over the integer. So, I guess, um, in essence, I should say that every factorization over a field, which we understand very well. works over the original ring after um, after multiplying by some constants basically <clears throat> so the key here so the the key idea Is, is clearing denominators. And, and the thing about the smallest common denominator is that you need a U of T to have it. You, you can't talk about greatest common divisors or least common multiples if you don't have unique factorization into primes. 
as you you know you can just think of the examples so you you know you have these and I mean we've seen examples where there's no greatest common divisor so you have fractions with those denominators and there's just nothing you can do um, so okay so what I'm gonna do is gonna look the good news is it's gonna look exactly like the thing we did over Z um, so I don't know it's essentially it's review. Um, so um, I guess forever, let's say that R is a U of D. Um, let F R be its field of fractions. So, um, so we will say, we say a polynomial over, um, over the ring is primitive. If If the, the greatest common divisor of all the all the coefficients is one, so for example, um, on on z at join x, um, x squared plus three x plus nine is primitive. Um, 2x plus 2 is not. And well, this is not primitive either um, because it's not even, it doesn't even have integer coefficients. Um, another very interesting example comes from another, well, we know a lot of UFTs now. We know like Gaussian integers, that kind of stuff. But also, uh, we know polynomial rings in one variable are UFT, basically. Um, or we're about to maybe we're about to prove it. I don't know. Nah, maybe I'll, I'll get into it later. So. Um, proposition so any any polynomial is something primitive and and just a number if if you have a polynomial even over the field of fractions um we can write p of x equals times a and then Q of X with a, a constant and Q uh, primitive. And like we did, well, like we did with over Z, we call A the content. So the content is that extra constant that is preventing your polynomial from being primitive, from having, you know, it's the common divisor or the common denominator. Oh, okay, it's still updating. So, so these numbers are fractions. So think back of what we did uh, to prove this before and what, what are we supposed to do now? Uh, 
what are we supposed to do now? Can you just show the GCD of all the AIs as one? I mean, that wouldn't, that doesn't have to be true um, because the polynomial is anything, right? The polynomial could be, could be this one, 2x plus 2. So I need to make it so that it becomes 1. You divide by the leading coefficient of the of an. You divide the polynomial by an. I could do that. Um, so then I would have a one. I'm not sure that I gained something. Doesn't that imply that you have like a constant times a primitive polynomial? I mean, first of all, to be primitive, the, the coefficients need to be in the ring, not fractions. Uh, and we don't know about the GCD even after doing this. I guess, I mean, the GCD doesn't make sense for fractions. So Duncan says, take the GCD, which would work if the A's were elements in the ring. So that's a great idea. So, okay. We got the second step, but we didn't get the, the first step. So, if somehow I make I make things belong to the ring, I can definitely take the GCD and divide by that, and that's gonna be that's gonna be it. So how do I take a bunch, a bunch of fractions and turn them into not fractions? You multiply by the uh, least common multiple. Of yes. All the AIs. Exactly. Um, right. Um, Alex and Duncan get a bonus point. So that's it. Um, so, um, so we can, actually we can just multiply by any multiple. What we will have is um, one big denominator and then some new numbers or ring elements, I guess. And these are now in the ring because we pulled the denominator out. So here we didn't really use that it's a U of T because we could just multiply all the denominators. I mean, you use a U of T does tell you one thing, one thing that U, a U of T has that if you have a fraction there, it makes sense to talk about least terms, which we could have done, but eh. <clears throat> But now, I'm going to do what Duncan said and take the GCD of all of these numbers. And we will have and just pull it out. So, so that's it. Um, the existence, at least. That's a constant. It's a fraction. Um, and all of these are, are in the ring because B is a divisor of all of the numerators. Oh, wow, things are happening. Oh, so this is not in sync. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it in the next slide. So each of this is a fraction. So 
So what you can do is pull out all the denominators and you will be left with some numbers. So these are all in the ring. And now you take the GCD of the coefficients and, and you can pull that out. Just call this T, it doesn't matter what it is. And you will have all this stuff. And now, and now we're done. Um, this is a number, it's a constant. It's in a field of fractions. I mean, it definitely has a denominator that I can't get rid of. Uh, these, since, since B divides all of these, um, these are not really fractions because the denominator divides the numerator. And since, and what's their, their GCD? It's it's one because we took a bunch of a bunch of elements and we divided by the common denominator, by the common divisor. So anything that divided all of these um well has to be one. If something divides if A divides B I divided by B, that would mean that A B divides B I, which would mean that a divides B because B is the GCD of BI. No, sorry, B divides A. It divides the greatest common divisor. So A is a unit. So that's the only device that we could have. And, and that's it. <clears throat> All right, so any questions? So the, the thing is, these are not integers, uh, but you can, since this is a U of G, you can think that everything is factored into primes. So you can take the GCD by picking the common factors in the factorization. Um, and all these reasonings that you do, for example, dividing by the GCD makes the the common device for one. It's, it's clear if you think of just taking out the common factors. What can be left of the common factors if you take them out? Nothing. Uh, okay, so uniqueness. Um, so suppose, suppose we wrote this in two different ways. These are constants and these are primitive. Uh, let's show that A has to be equal to A prime. Could you even just say that uh, B and D are unique because it's the least common multiple and it's the, D is also the product of all the Bs. So then it has to be I wouldn't say they're I wouldn't say they're unique because I never said the fractions are written in the smallest terms, you know. B divided by D doesn't have to be like, I think I could go that route and and find this answer, but I, I don't really need to. Honestly. Um, oh, I'm not gonna have time. Oh. Anyway, um all right, Wednesday. All right. Um okay, well. My office hours are right now, so...